lives in a friend sort of brother I suppose our brothers I don't care about brothers my elder brother won't die and my younger brother seem to do anything else Harry exclaimed Hallward frowning my dear fellow I'm not quite serious but I can't help detesting my relationship relations I suppose it comes from the fact that none of us can stand other people having the same faults as ourselves. I quite sympathise with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices, the upper orders. The masses feel that drunkenness, stupidity, and immorality, immorality should be their own special poverty, and that if any of us makes an ass of himself, he is poaching on their preserves. When Paul Southwark got into the divorce court, their indignation was quite magnificent. And yet, I don't suppose that 10% of the proletariat live correctly. I don't agree with a single word that you have said. And what is more, Harry, I feel sure you don't either. Lord Andrew stroked his pointed brown beard and tapped the toe of his patent leather boot with a tasseled ebony cane. How English you are, Basil. That is the second time you have made that observation. If one puts forward an idea to a true Englishman, always a rash thing to do, he never dreams of considering whether the idea is right or wrong. The only thing he considers of any importance is whether one pleased oneself. Now, the value of an idea has nothing whatsoever to do with the sincerity of the man who expresses it. Indeed, the probabilities are that the that the more insincere the man is, the more barely intellectual will the idea be, as in that case it will not be coloured by either his wants, his desires, or his prejudices. However, I don't dis uh, uh, however, I don't propose to discuss politics, sociology, or metaphysics with you. I like persons better than principles, and I like persons with no principles better than anything else in the world. Tell me more about Mr. Dorian Gray, and how evident do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. He's absolutely necessary to me. How extraordinary. I thought you'd never care for anything but your art. He's all my art to me now, said the painter gravely. I sometimes think, Harry, that there are only two errors of any importance in the world's history. The first is the the first is the appearance of a new medium for art, and the second is the appearance of a new personality for art also. What the invention of oil painting was to the Venetians, the face of Anus was to lay Greek sculpture, and the face of Dorian Gray will someday to be me. Someday be to me. It is not merely that I paint from him, draw from him, sketch from him. Of course, I have done all that, but he's much more to me than a model or a sitter. I won't tell you that I am dissatisfied with what I have done with him, or that his beauty is such that art cannot express it. There is nothing that art cannot express, and I know that the work I have done since I met Dorian Gray is good work. It's the best work of my life, but in some curious way. I wonder who understand me. His personality has suggested to me an entirely new matter in art, an entirely new mode of style. I see things differently. I think of them differently. I can now recreate life in a way that I was hidden from me before. A dream of warming days of thought. Who is it? Who says that? I forget, but it is what Dorian Gray has been to me. The merely visible presence of this lad. For he seems to be he seems to me little more than a lad, though he is really over twenty, this merely visible presence. Oh I wonder can you realise all that that means? Unconsciously he divines for me the lines of a fresh school school that is to have in it all the passion, the romantic spirit, or the perfection of the spirit that is a Greek, the harmony of soul and body, how much that is. We in our madness have separated the two, and invented a realism that is Virgo, vulgar, and an identity that is void. Harry, if you only knew what Dorian Gray is to me. Remember that landscape of mine, for which Anglin offered me such a huge prize. But which I would not part with. It is one of the best things I have ever done. And why is it so? Because while I was painting it, Dorian Gray sat beside me. Some subtle influence passed from him to me, and for the first time in my life I saw in the plain woodland the wonder I had always looked for and always missed. Basil, this is extraordinary. I must see Dorian Gray. Hallward got up from the seat and walked up and down the garden. After some time he came back. Harry. He said, Dorian Gray is me simply a motive in art. You might see nothing in him. I see everything in him. He is never 
of all present in my work. The Bruno Im image of him is there. He is a suggestion, as I have said, of a new manner. I find him in the curves of certain lines, in the loveliness and subtil subtleties of certain colours. That is all. Why, why, then why won't you exhibit his portrait? asked Lord Henry. Because without intending it, I have put into, into it some expression of all this curious artistic idolatry, of which, of course, I have never cared to speak to him. He knows nothing about it. He shall never know anything about it. But the world might guess it, and I will not bear my soul to their shallow, prying eyes. My heart shall never be put under their microscope. There is too much of myself in the thing, Harry. Too much of myself. Poets are not so sculptures as you are. They know how useful passion is for some publication. Nowadays, a broken heart will run to make editions. I hate them for it quite hard. An artist should create beautiful things, but should put nothing of his own life into them. We live in an age when men treat art as if it, as if it were meant to be a form of autobiography. We have lost the abstract sense of beauty. Someday I will show the world what it is, and for that reason the world shall never see my portrait of Dorian Gray. I think you are wrong, Basil, but I won't argue with you. It is only the intellectually lost who have argued. Tell me, is Dorian Gray very fond of you? The painter considered for a few moments. He likes me, he answered after a pause. I know he likes me. Of course, I flatter him dreadfully. I find a strange pleasure in saying things to him that I know I shall be sorry for having said. As a rule, he is charming to me, and we sit in the studio and talk of a thousand things. Now and then, however, he is a bit thoughtless and seems to take a real delight in giving me pain. Then I feel, Harry, that I have given away my whole soul to someone who treats me, treats it as if it were a flower to put in his coat, a bit of decoration to charm his vanity, an ornament for some mistake. Days in some other person are apt to linger, murmured Lord Henry. Perhaps he will tire sooner than he will. It is a sad thing to think of, but there is no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty. That accounts for the fact that we all take such pains to over-educate ourselves. In the wild struggle for existence, we want to have something that endures, and so fill our minds with rubbish and facts, the silly hope of keeping our place. The thoroughly well-informed man, that is the modern idea, in the mind of the thoroughly well-informed man is a dreadful thing. It is like a brick of rock shop, our monsters in dust, with something, with everything priced above its proper value. I think you will tire first, all the same. Some day we'll look at your friend, and he will seem to you to be a little out of drawing, or you want like a stone of colour or something. You will bitterly reapproach him in your own heart and seriously think that he has behaved very badly to you. The next time he calls, you will be perfectly cold and indifferent. It will be a great pity where it will after you. It will alter you. What you have told me is quite a romance, a romance of art, one might call it, and the worst of having a romance of any kind is that it leaves one so unromantic. Hurry! Don't talk like that. As long as I live, the personality of Dorian Gray will dominate me. You can't feel what I feel. You change too often. Oh, my dear Basil, that is exactly why I can't feel it, where I can feel it. Those who are the faithful know only the trivial side of love. It is the faithless who know love strategies. And Lord Henry struck a light on a dainty silver case and began to smoke a cigarette with a self-conscious and satisfied air, as if he had summed up the world in a phrase. There was a rustle of dropping sparrows in the green lacquer leaves of the ivy and the blue cloud shadows chased themselves across the grass like swallows. How pleasant it was in the garden, and how delightful other people's emotions were. Much more delightful than their ideas, it seemed to him. One's own soul and the passion of one's friend, one's friends, those were the fascinating things in life. He pictured to himself with silent amusement the tedious luncheon that he had missed by staying so long with Bess by Hathaway. Had he gone to his aunt's, he would have been sure to have met Lord Goodbody there, and the whole conversation would have been about the feeding of the poor and the necessity and necessity of model lodging houses. Each class would have raged at the importance of those virtues for those ex exercised there was no necessity in their own lives. The rich would have spoken on the value of thrift and the ideal ground eloquent over the dignity of labour. It was charming to have escaped all that. As he thought of his aunt, an idea seemed to strike him. He turned to Howard and said, My dear fellow, I have just remembered. 
his name was Dorian Gray. I'm proud to state that she never told me he was good looking. Women have no appreciation of good looks. At least good women have not. She said that he was very earnest and had a beautiful nature. I had once pictured to myself a creature with spectacles and black hair, but horribly freckled and tramping about on huge feet. I wish I had known it was your friend. I'm very glad you didn't, Harry. Why? I don't want you to meet him. You don't want me to meet him? No. Mr. Dorian Gray is in that studio, sir, said the butler, coming into the garden. You must introduce me now, cried Lord Henry, laughing. The painter turned to his servant who stood blinking in the sunlight and asked Mr. Gray to wait, Parker. I shall be in a few moments. The man bowed and went up the dock. That uh, went up the walk. Then he looked at Lord Henry. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend, he said. He has a simple and a beautiful nature. Your aunt was quite right in what she said of him. Don't spoil him. Don't try to influence him. Your influence would be bad. The world is wide and has many marvellous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives to my art whatever charm he possesses. My life as an artist depends on him. Mind, Harry, I trust you. He spoke very slowly, and the words seemed wrung out of him almost against his will. What nonsense, you dog, said Lord Henry, smiling, and taking Hobart by the arm. He almost led him into the house. Chapter 2 As they entered, they saw Dorian Gray. He was seated at the piano with his back to them, turning over the pages of a volume of Schumann's forest scenes. You must lend me these, Basil, he cried. I won't lend them. They're perfectly charming. That entirely depends on how you sit today, Dorian. Oh, I am tired of sitting, and I don't want a life-size portrait of myself, answered the lad, swinging around on the music stool in a willful, petulant manner. When he caught sight of Lord Henry, a faint blush colored his cheeks for a moment, and he started up. I beg your pardon, Basil, but I didn't know you had any of anyone with you. This is Lord Henry Watson Dorian, an old Oxford friend of mine. I have just been telling him what a capital sitter you were, and now you have spoiled everything. You, you have not spoiled my pleasure in meeting you, Mr. Graham, said Lord Henry, stepping forward and extending his hand. My aunt has often spoken to me about you. You are one of her favourites, and I am afraid one of her victims also. I am in Lady Agatha's black books at present, answered Dorian with a funny look of penitence. I promised to go to a club in White Chapel with her last Tuesday, and I really forgot all about it. We were to have played a duet together. Three duets, I believe. I don't know what she will say to me. I am far too frightened to call. Oh, I will make your peace with my aunt. She is quite devoted to you. And I don't think it really matters about your not being there. The audience probably thought it was a duet. When Aunt Agatha sits down on the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two people. That is very horrid uh, and not very nice to me, answered Dorian, laughing. Lord Henry looked at him. Yes, he was certainly wonderfully handsome, with his finely curved, scarred lips, his frank blue eyes, his crisp cold hair. There was something in his face that made one trust him at once. All the candor of youth was there, as well as all youth's passion and purity. One felt that he had kept himself unspotted from the world. No wonder Basil Harvard worshipped him. You're too charming to go and for philanthropy, Mr. Graham. Far too charming. And Lord Henry flung himself down on the divan and opened his secret case. The painter had been busy mixing his colours and painting his and getting his brushes ready. He was looking worried, and when he heard Lord Henry's last remark, he glanced at him, hesitated for a moment, and then said, Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it awfully rude of me if I asked you to go away? Lord Henry smiled and looked at Dorian Gray. Am I to go? Mr. Gray asked. Oh, please don't, Lord Henry. I see that Basil is in one of his sulky moods, and I can't bear him when he sulks. Besides, I want you to tell me why I should not go in for philanthropy. I don't know that I shall tell you that, Mr. Gray. It is so tedious a subject that one would have to talk seriously about it. But I certainly shall not run away now that you have asked me to stop. You don't really mind Basil, do you? You have often told me that you like to sit as to have some of, want someone to chat to. Oh, wet bit slipped. If Dorian wishes it, of course you must stay. Dorian's whims are lost to everybody except himself. Lord Henry took up his hat and gloves. You are very pressing, Basil, but I am afraid I must go. I've promised to meet a man at the audience. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Come and see me 
listening and never listen either. It must be dreadfully tedious for my unfortunate sitters. I beg you to stay. But what about my man at the Orleans? The painter laughed. I don't think there will be any difficult about that. Sit down again, Harry. And now, Dorian, get upon the platform and don't move about too much, or pay any attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence over all his friends, with a single exception of himself. Dorian Gray stepped on the dais with the air of a young Greek martyr and made a little move of discontent to Lord Henry, to me had rather taken a fancy. He was so unlike Basil. They made a delightful contrast. He had such a beautiful voice. After a few moments, he said to him, Have you really a very bad influence, Lord Henry? As bad as Basil says. There is no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immor immoral, immoral from the scientific point of view. Why? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think it's his natural thoughts are burned with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. He borrowed. Becomes an echo of someone else's music, an actor of a part that has not been written for him. The aim of life is self-development, to realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty that one owes to oneself. Of course, they are charitable. They feed the hungry and clothe the beggar, but their own souls starve and are naked. Courage has gone out of our race. Perhaps we never really had it. The terror of society, which is the basis of morals, the terror of God, which is the secret of religion. There are two things that govern us, and yet, just turn your head a little more to the right, Dorian. Like a good boy, said the painter, deep in his work, and consciously only that look had come into the lad's face. They had never seen that before. And yet, continued Lord Henry, in his low, musical voice, and with that graceful wave of the hand that was always so characteristic of him, that he had even in his as eaten days. I believe that if one man were to live out his life fully and completely, who were to give form to every feeling, expression to every thought, reality to every dream, I believe that the world would gain such a fresh impulse of joy that we would forget all the maladies of medievalism and return to the Hellenic ideal, to something finer, richer than the Hellenic ideal it may be. But the bravest man amongst us is afraid of himself. The mutilation of the savage has its tragic survival in the self-denial that mars our lives. We are punished for our refusals. Every impulse that we strive on stra strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The body sins once and has done with its sin for action is a mode of purification. Nothing remains then but the recollection of a pleasure or the luxury of a regret. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Resist it and your soul grows sick with longing. But things it has forbidden it to itself, with, does it, with desire for what its mon monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. It has been said that the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain and the brain only that the great sins of the world take place also. You, Mr. Gray, you yourself with your rose red youth and your rose white your boyhood, you have had passions that have made you afraid, thoughts that have filled you with terror, daydreams and sleeping dreams who merely, whose mere memory might strain your cheeks of shame. Stop, faltered Dorian Gray, stop, you bewilder me, I don't know what to say, there is some answer to you, but I cannot find it, don't speak, let me think, or rather, let me try not to think. For nearly ten minutes he stood there, motionless, with parted lips and eyes strangely bright, he was dimly conscious that entirely fresh influences were at work within him, within him, yet they seemed to him to have come really from himself. The few words that Basil's friend had said to him, words spoken.